Bienvenue à la grande simplification. I'd like to welcome to the show uh, Jean-Marc Jankovici. Uh, Jean-Marc is a French engineering consultant, professor, author, and independent columnist. He is very well known in France. He's been working at the intersection of climate energy and economics uh, for over 20 years. He's the co-founder and associate at the Carbon 4 consultancy firm, as well as the founding president of the think tank, The Shift Project. This was a weird conversation because I have never watched until a few hours before this any of his work, and he's never watched any of my work, and we're saying almost the same things which to me uh, is a robust finding, uh, and I hope to collaborate with Jean-Marc in the future. Please welcome Jean-Marc Jankovici. Jean-Marc, good to see you. Welcome to the program. Good morning, or good afternoon, I don't know. <laughs> It is almost almost afternoon here. You are seven hours ahead of me. So you and I have been sharing similar stories and viewpoints. From what I understand, uh, the past two decades, a lot of people have told me about your work. It was only this morning that I watched uh, one of your English uh, videos. So could you start us off by, in your own words, um, give us kind of a long elevator pitch of how you see the human situation with respect to energy, climate, systems, oil depletion, et cetera. What's the big picture? Well, actually the big picture goes back to two centuries in, in rough figures. Uh, the reason why we're today able to talk together, uh, even though we are thousands of miles apart uh, and uh, we all have a computer and we all have plenty of food to eat and we all have a big house and we all have uh, means to move around uh, for uh, actually not a lot of money uh, is called fossil fuels. Uh, what happened to humanity for the last two centuries is that thanks to fossil fuels and thanks to machines that were put in motion by these fossil fuels, we have progressively replaced hard human labor uh, by easy, so to say, human labor, which consists in giving orders to machines. Uh, that plant and harvest the crops for us, uh, ha pl plant and harvest cotton and knit clothes for us. Uh, we have machines that move us around, manufacture the billions of goods that we can now purchase in stores. Uh, we have all these machines that fly, uh, sail, move around, etc. We have the machines that heat our homes, build our homes, etc. Well, basically, we live in the world of machines. And uh, the conclusion to which I've come, uh, I would say, during the last 20 years, is that what framed the 19th and 20th centuries uh, is, uh, actually bears a very simple name, coal, oil and gas, and the internal combustion engine and the steam machine. Basically, that's what happened to humanity for the last two centuries. Thanks to, or thanks, or not thanks, I don't know, uh, to fossil fuels, uh, the number of people on Earth grew from 1 billion to 8 billion. Life expectancy at birth uh, went from, let's say, a little bit under 30 in 1800 to uh, the world average is probably around 65 today. Even in India, uh, life expectancy at birth is over 70. Uh, so that the, the, we have, again, uh, all, all, all the material goods that we have today uh, is, is due to fossil fuels. This has also framed uh, the, the, the geography and uh, I would say the settlements uh, of people, uh, as it is no longer necessary to have people uh, in, the, in the fields growing food. Uh, we have progress progressively shifted uh, to industrial then office jobs or tertiary jobs, uh, so to say. Uh, that we that we have in cities, so we progressively went to a, a to, to a, a type of settlements where most people live in cities, and actually you can observe that everywhere in the world. The more energy per capita you have, and the more people live in cities. Uh, and uh, the, the so the modern urban uh, world with people uh, working in offices or, or or in commercial buildings 
living in a home and owning a car uh, is basically the type of the, the way of living that you have everywhere uh, when uh, abundant energy comes in. Uh, it's, it's basically what happened everywhere. And of course, uh, this comes with the price. Uh, actually, the first price that it comes with is that all, all these fossil fuels have changed the composition of the atmosphere through their burning. And it has increased a natural effect called the greenhouse effect that was discovered by a French two centuries ago, <laughs> Joseph Fourier, uh, in 1824. Uh, and this uh, greenhouse effect is being increased or enhanced uh, by all the extra CO2 that we pour into the atmosphere, knowing that the CO2 is a very stable molecule because it's an oxide and oxides are very stable chemical compounds. And it, it, it leads to a change of the, of the climate system, a climate drift, uh, so to say, uh, which is going to be an increasing burden. And the other price that we have to pay is that uh, all this, uh, I would say, industrial civilization uh, rests on uh, non-renewable resources that we have to uh, use and destroy when we use them uh, more and more. Uh, fossil fuels, namely, we destroy them when we use them, uh, but also metals. Uh, today, our modern civilization needs the, all the metals that we have found on Earth. Uh, the computer that I'm using right now and that you are using right now uh, needs 40 to 60 different metals to be manufactured. Uh, we, uh, so so the, the, the civilization that we have built uh, is increasing, increasingly complex uh, and dependent on non-natural resources that can be depleted. Uh, so the, the two main challenges, I would say, the two main global limits that we face today is a global limit regarding the environment that cannot accept all the waste that we pour into it, CO2 being one of it, uh, being, being one of the, I would say, one of the best documented uh, and addressed today, but there are many more, and uh, an, an upstream bottleneck uh, on non-renewable resources uh, that we would like to have more and more, and it's not sure that we will have more and more. Actually, regarding oil, uh, it's almost sure that we will not have more and more, and in a couple of years, we will have less and less, globally speaking, in the world. I mean, so that's the challenge we address. And one of the difficulties that comes with it is that very few people understand the challenge because it is not something that you can get through the most common indicator that, you, that we use the, uh, every day, which is money. Uh, the challenge that I just uh, evoked is not embedded into current prices uh, because basically natural assets have no price. And so we cannot realize that there is a challenge through prices. But it happens that the only quantitative indicator that we use every day is money. We, we don't, we don't, I mean, you don't take your blood pressure every day. You don't measure the amount of CO2 that you put into the air every day. You don't measure the mass of copper that you use every day. I mean, the only thing that you count every day is money, basically. Uh, and so the difficulty is that, uh, the, as the challenge is not embedded into prices, uh, it is very difficult for uh, people that have not devoted their life to uh, uh, studying the challenge, as I, uh, as I have done, uh, to, to understand it easily. Magnifique. That was a better summary than I've ever done, I think, even though we're telling the same story. When, when was your red pill moment, Jean-Marc, when you first realized how central that energy was to the entire uh, civilization and our expectations and everything? Actually, I had a collection of red pills, of small red pills. <laughs> uh, my first red pill was when I realized the magnitude of the challenge regarding climate change. Uh, actually, uh, historically, I came to climate change before coming to energy. Uh, the, the way uh, I got my revelation, so to say, uh, is that uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, I was working in the telecommunication sector. And it was the time uh, where uh, the, the, the operators were very excited by the idea of developing remote activities. It was the beginning of telework, uh, uh, re remote learning, and all these things. And I was, as a basic consultant, uh, doing business plans uh, for the main French operator in telecommunications, Orange, today. At the time, it was France Telecom. 
uh, and studying the fact, well, well, looking at the fact that uh, home offices could could spare uh, people moving, or could spare uh, car commuting, I came across the word greenhouse gases, uh, and I asked myself, what is that? <laughs> so I began looking. Uh, so that was my first red pill moment. Uh, I understood that uh, we were changing the composition of the atmosphere and that it could, I would say, trigger a, a change of climate era in one century. Uh, whereas in the past, uh, it was done in 10,000 years uh, with people able to move around, which is not the case today because we have settled. Uh, my second red pill moment was when I tried to understand uh, what was causing this and uh, what the link between the way we live and energy. And this, my second red pill moment was when I realized that actually energy or the increase of energy supply had been uh, the main driver uh, over a century, say, uh, that, that framed all the countries in the world. Uh, basically, you give machines to a country <coughs> and the evolution is always the same. People leave the fields, go to factories, then to sit, then to offices, uh, live in cities. Their purchasing power increases. They get retirement. They get long studies. They get vacations. Uh, they get their weekends. They work less in the week. They vote. Uh, I mean, everything came in with that, with energy. And that was my second red pill moment because then I, I, I asked myself, where, where, where will the world go the day we have less and less energy? Will we keep democracies uh, or will we have rights everywhere and, and social unrest, uh, which is unfortunately happening here and there more and more? Uh, will we keep peace uh, or is something that won't happen? How are we going to, in, in a way, uh, become sober without the whole society collapsing. That, that's, uh, I still haven't, I still haven't the, an, the, the complete answer, but, <laughs> uh, but that was my second red pill moment. Then I had another red pill moment when I realized the way democracies operate. And I realized that uh, a fast reaction to that issue would not happen. Uh, that, that was, I would say, a third red pill moment. So I, I had at least three. And maybe through our discussion, I will discover that I have more. Yeah, the room the room is full of red pills. Um, we actually have so much in common on how we see this. So if I was an economist or a world leader listening to your summary, I might say, yes, but it's technology that caused all the increase in population and the increase in wealth and services and the increase in city and re retirement and vacation. It's human innovation that caused it. Um, do you encounter that pushback and how do you respond to it? Well, it's an easy answer because actually to spread technology, you basically have to spread the objects that embed the technology. So you have to manufacture plenty of objects and uh, manufacturing plenty of objects uh, bears a name, which is energy because you need plenty of industrial uh, of plenty of energy into the industrial system to uh, I can put it the other way around uh, let's suppose that tomorrow morning you do not have much energy and you can't manufacture cars anymore even if you have brilliant engineers how do you spread technical progress in cars if you can't manufacture cars obviously you can't <laughs> and if you can manufacture cars that people can't use because there is no energy to use the cars how do you spread technical progress in cars. You can't. So it's very easy to explain that actually spreading technical, finding something which is new doesn't require much energy. Actually, it requires a little energy because it requires free time. Uh, in the Middle Ages, people were uh, busy uh, feeding themselves because it's the first need of humanity. And once the day was over and they had worked all day to feed themselves, they had no spare time to find uh, whatever, the proton or the neutron or, or the electron or, <laughs> or the way to, to, to conceive uh, an electric engine. Uh, the, 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 one of the reasons why we have plenty of researchers today able to, and, and, and Mr. Musk can hire plenty of engineers is that precisely machines are growing the food for us. Uh, if we were busy harvesting potatoes, we wouldn't do any research. Uh, wouldn't have the time to do so. Uh, 
When you look at countries that are still very sober regarding their energy consumption in Africa, for example, they do not have many engineers and they do not have many researchers. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's also the result of abundant energy that we can have research and technology. But to spread, again, a technology, uh, we, we need plenty of energy because we need to manufacture plenty of objects. So there are a lot of uh, very um, ambitious technological plans in the future, such as net zero, and uh, there are promises of decoupling or dematerializing GDP from energy and materials. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? So far, it never happened. Uh, actually, 15 years ago, I began doing something very simple. Uh, which is plotting uh, the world GDP against the world energy consumption. Uh, I've got data going up to 1965, and I was astonished to discover that I got almost a straight line. So mm -hmm. when you plot the world GDP in constant dollars against the world energy consumption, which is actually the size of the active fleet of machines in the world, that's what the energy consumption is, you get almost a straight line you have a little improvement of the energy efficiency every year. So actually, it's not exactly a straight line, something which is slightly mm -hmm. convex, uh, but you get almost a straight line. And the reason why is very simple, actually, to have, uh, as long as the GDP counts the same thing, that is uh, square feet of construction, uh, goods moving around, uh, goods being manufactured, uh, number of ships operating in the world, etc. You have physical things, and in, in the physical world, you have rules that you, that you cannot, sorry for the repetition, overrule. I mean, <laughs> like, for example, to put a mass in motion, you require minimum energy, which is the mass times uh, the square of the, of the speed times one half. And you cannot say it's one quarter <laughs> because it would be, I would save energy if it were one quarter. So I'm going to vote at the Congress that it's one quarter. And you cannot do that. Uh, it's always one half. So uh, you, you, you have limits. Uh, you can near the limit, but you cannot overcome it. Uh, I'm going to take a, another example. Uh, to go from iron ore to iron, you have to remove the oxygen in the iron ore. Uh, actually, iron ore is an iron oxide. Uh, the most common molecule in iron ore is two atoms of iron for three atoms of oxygen. To remove the oxygen, you use carbon, coal, actually, metallurgical coal. You need 1.5 atom of carbon to remove the three atoms of oxygen, and it will never be one, and it will never be 0.8. It will always be 1.5. So in the physical world, you have physical limits, and it's the reason why uh, when you look at the energy consumption per physical unit, per kilogram of steel, per kilogram of copper, per the improvement actually is very low. It, it, it's very slow. It, it doesn't go fast, and you have an absolute limit that you cannot overcome. So the, and, and, and in the future, uh, we, will, we might even degrade the energy efficiency of the industry because the concentration of copper in the copper ore, for example, decreases with time, which means that you need more and more energy to get one kilogram of copper. And so at a certain point with time, you will not have an improvement of the energy efficiency of mining copper, but you will have a degradation of the energy efficiency of mining copper. You see? So, but again, when you look at, 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 at the past, uh, you have, there is no decoupling uh, at, at the world level. You have a slight decoupling in some given countries, but that's thanks to trade because you have the added value in the country and the industrial process that or, or, the, or, the, or the physical flow that that provides this added value, which is outside the country. So it's an illusion. When you look at the world as a whole, you have no decoupling in the past and there is no major reason that you can get a decoupling in the future. Jean-Marc, have you ever watched one of my lectures or any of my videos? I confess that I have not done so recently. Well, then, then I, 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 I'm very happy because you are telling my story and we've never met and never watched each other's videos, which means the story is robust. I feel like I found a brother from another mother. I mean, I, I say these sure. same things over independent research for the last 20 years. And I, I, 
I just question how, why it is that so few people have connected these dots. And I suspect that one reason is, is that the total, as you said earlier, the total amount of energy available to society has increased every year. And that is hiding the, uh, all of the future assumptions and plans just implicitly assume that will continue. So they miss the centrality of energy, abundant and cheap, are, are contributing to our society. Well, why do you think you and I and many others have been talking about this for 20 years and it is still not, well, maybe in France it has, but elsewhere in the world, this is still a narrative of technology and money um, and energy and materials are, are, are out in the distance in the explanatory stories. You're, you're, you're geographically closer to the answer than I am. Uh, I believe that it's a consequence of the University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I uh, went to graduate school. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, it's, it, it, it goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, many people in the economic world believe that physical constraints are embedded into prices. And one of the things that they believe is that there is an elasticity between prices and volumes. So that if you near a limit, you will see it into prices. And if you don't see anything into prices, it's that you are far from the limits. I will explain in a couple of seconds why it is false for commodities that are essential uh, to our modern economy. Uh, for oil or steel, for example, it is false. I, I can explain that very easily. There is no elasticity. Uh, and that's so that's one of the reasons why, of course, uh, and, and it goes back to framing. Uh, actually, it's not the fault of the University of Chicago, because before that, it was the fault of uh, French and English thinkers, uh, earlier thinkers, early thinkers, sorry, of the of the classical economy. Uh, two centuries ago, basically, the classical economists said uh, in the world, we are going to count what is the limiting factor of production, which is which is. Uh, the economic science. Basically, it is addressing the limiting factors of production. And at the time, two centuries ago, uh, basically, the economy was still a lot centered on agriculture. There, there was a little industry, but basically. And what they said is that there is plenty of land, uh, plenty of resources. Uh, we, don't, we don't lack uh, iron ore. We don't lack coal. We don't, the only thing that we can lack is human labor and human capital. So the only thing that we are going to count is human labor, which is a way, a, a kind of energy, but it's a slight part of the energy that we can that we can get, and human capital, which is also a, a, a limiting factor. But there are plenty other limiting factors uh, among natural capital. Uh, if you are a fisherman, uh, you, you you need a natural capital, which is fish. You don't only need human capital, which is a boat. Uh, and you don't need only sailors. Uh, you also need, or actually, if you're a modern fisherman, uh, a little oil or a little diesel oil to put into the engine. So basically, uh, and, and what they have done is that they have invented that, that technological progress, which is, for example, the solo residue in, uh, in, in Solo's vision, uh, which is uh, the, the total productivity of factor, if, if you look at Cobb Douglas, etc. So you, they, they invented that term, which has, which cannot be predicted, which can only explain ex post what happened, <laughs> which is fantastic, uh, which was called technological progress, and which actually, when you look carefully at things, is energy, machines, and, and natural resources. That's what actually it is. But as it is not explicit, people stick to prices. And they believe that with prices, you can explain all what happens to the productive system. Now, why is it false that we have no elasticity between prices and volumes regarding oil or steel, for example? It's because these commodities are essential to modern economy. If you produce less oil in the world, if you have less oil, you will have less cars, less trucks, less planes, and less boats that can operate. Therefore, your economy will shrink a little. And if the economy shrinks a little, people earn less because basically the revenues are equal to the production. That's basic, basic macroeconomic formula. So if people earn less and have less money and you have less oil to offer them, you don't know whether the new equilibrium price of oil will be higher or lower than the former price. 
And actually, when you look at past prices, there is no clear relationship. Uh, with less oil, you can have prices that are lower, prices that are higher, you can get everything. Same thing for steel. The modern world fully relies on steel. If you have less steel, it's an essential commodity for the economy. So if you produce less steel, you will destroy a little part of the economy. Then for producing less, people earn less. And then you again, the, the, the new equilibrium price of steel has no reason to be higher or lower than the previous one. So there is no elasticity between prices and volumes for commodities that are essential to uh, the functioning of the economy. If you take a commodity which is non-essential, like handbags, for example, <laughs> if you produce less handbags, of course, it will not destroy the economy. You have this, the people have the same purchasing power, only you have less handbags. And so the price of the handbag goes up. So that's okay. But it, that, but this relationship is, is, it, is, is, it doesn't apply to commodities that are essential to uh, framing uh, the, the, the modern economy. Which is why, for example, you won't see oil depletion coming through oil prices going forever up. You will see them with GDP going forever down. That's the way you will see it. But nominal prices, and today, as economists have uh, never looked at the relationship between energy and GDP, when the GDP goes down, it's the fault of uh, bankers, people that don't want to work, uh, lazy, those lazy, but whatever. But they, they never see energy in the picture. So energy and volume. I mean, there's a biophysical economist uh, who used to be on our advisory board called Reiner Kummel, who explained the yeah, solo res. He explained the solo residual is almost all energy. Um, and I, I yes. think if if we did it on a global basis, it would be like over 90% of it. I think his numbers were 60 some percent. But yeah, um, excellent. So, so what are your thoughts? Uh, you mentioned money and GDP. What are your opinions on finance and quantitative easing as adding false or temporary wealth to the economy in the in the last couple decades and how does that affect some people's claims that we're decoupling energy from gdp i am not an expert on quantitative easing but one of the conclusions that i've come to is that it led to an inflation of assets mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, there is an old theory that says that when you create money in excess uh, compared to the physical possibilities of the economy to produce something it leads to inflation. Uh, actually, what happened during the last 20 years is that uh, creating money didn't lead to inflation in common goods, but it led to inflation in assets, real estate, so. uh, stocks, uh, etc. Uh, so that's, that's what happened, basically. And that inflation of assets is not fully corrected uh, in deflating uh, all that you count in the GDP. For example, if you have a square meter, or sorry, a square foot <laughs> uh, in a building, uh, which costs twice the price, you will need a mortgage, which is twice the amount. And you will not, you, you will count uh, the production in banks as twice the previous production. You will not deflate that production on the basis that it's, all, it's always a square foot. Uh, it is physically still the same good. Uh, only cost twice the price, and so you have no reason uh, to count twice uh, the the, uh, the bank added value. So, and you have that same thing for the stock market. Uh, if stocks if stocks go up, you will not deflate that, uh, saying, "Okay, it's always a stock; it's always the same company." So there is no reason to count it for twice or ten times the price. Uh, and I have never had the opportunity. Uh, to make precise calculations to see what would have, how the GDP would have evolved uh, if we had discounted, so to say, uh, the inflation of assets from the GDP. But my belief is that it would have removed something, a little something. And the other thing that we should have removed from the GDP, uh, basically, is the debt. Because if you increase the GDP that you count today through increasing the debt that you have to reimburse tomorrow, Normally, uh, you should you should have an accounting closer to uh, an asset and liability accounting 
than to a PL accounting, uh, which is what we do. So, so you, you should count something for the creation of debt uh, that you should deduct from today's GDP. Uh, and that correction also has never been made. And the level of debt has never been as high, uh, well, actually, for the last century. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's never been as high as today. Except, except for the Second World War. It's even higher than that now as a percentage. But all that debt, Jean-Marc, when it's called in, when it's uh, created to be paid down, is a claim on energy. So all the debts that exist in the world, yes. when they're eventually paid down, and we don't have that amount of energy. So I think this, this one piece alone is being completely missed by the financial markets, in my opinion. Well, my, my belief is that it will end through inflation or default, or a mixture of the two. Uh, I, I, of course, have a preference for inflation because it's softer. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, we, we, we are building a kind of Ponzi pyramid, uh, mm -hmm. and we all know how it ends. But I, I, I agree. Uh, if you need extra GDP in the future to reimburse the debt, it means that you need extra energy. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you don't see how it fits uh, if we have less and less energy in the future. So temporarily, we can print more money, which is a facsimile for more energy, but it just extracts the existing energy we have faster. I am not sure that it had a major effect uh, on extraction of energy. It did have, in the US, a significant effect on the shale oil industry mm -hmm. uh, because during be, between 2010 and 2018, during the shale boom, uh, as you probably know, uh, shale operators, operators sorry, didn't earn a single buck. Uh, actually, they were all losing money. Uh, and, and they were also uh, building a kind of Ponzi pyramid. Uh, they were burning cash uh, and refinancing themselves uh, with, with, with new stock. Uh, and new debt uh, until uh, one year before COVID, uh, the financial sector said, "Now, now, end of the game. <laughs> we want our money back." And actually, the only way to get the money back is to stop drilling all the time, mm -hmm. uh, because with drilling all the time, uh, you have huge capex and and, and you, you you just burn cash. I mean, you you cannot earn money. And uh, the paradox of shale oil is that you can earn money only if you do not increase production too fast uh, or if you do not increase it at all. But quantitative easing did uh, favor uh, that, 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 uh, that movement, the, the, the extraction of shale oil. It mm -hmm. did have an effect. But after shale oil, there's, there's nothing left except for oil shale, which is basically uncooked uh, rock uh, with oil in it. So this is... That's not going to work. Sorry, at the Sheep Project, which is a, an NGO that I chair in France, uh, we have done a, a, a thorough analysis uh, with the data coming from Reichstadt Energy. Uh, we had mm -hmm. access to the full database of all the oil fields in the world uh, for a very minimum price. <laughs> and we published, uh, I think there is an English version, uh, our research on uh, the, 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 the projections that we make only under geological constraints. We do not mm -hmm. mention above ground constraints, uh, political pressure, climate, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on the perspective of uh, the 16 top suppliers of Europe, that includes US, which happen to be the 16 top producers in the world, except Canada, which is a significant mm -hmm. one, and Brazil. And the result of uh, our work is that the production, the combined production of these 16 countries should be divided by two between now and 2050, including shell oil and including tar sand. 2050, so 27 years from now, cut in half. 2050, 2050 by 2050, the combined yeah. production of these 16 top supplies of Europe, which includes all the Middle East, Russia, uh, all the uh, the U.S., uh, Mexico, or, or whatever. I mean, uh, uh, all the, the 16 top producers in the world, but Canada and Brazil. The production and should be divided by two, including shale oil. That's almost best case, unless there's some new technology. 
because it doesn't account for geopolitics or climate inability to get water to process the mining or no. or any any other complexity problems or things like that. I would say it's a no crisis scenario. Yeah, I I think that's plausible. Uh, I would expect my numbers might be a little bit higher, but you know, in that in that ballpark. So on that note, Jean Marc, um, my personal stance, and I, I expect you would agree that on a grand scale, climate change is the most existential issue that humanity faces this century. Um, however, you and I both believe that fossils are going to become economically unavailable sooner than our cultures are planning for. That eliminates a lot of the more extreme climate scenarios that some reports predict. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on that? What it excludes, in my view, is uh, the most extreme temperature increase coming from uh, greenhouse gases. But it doesn't exclude uh, consequences much more unpleasant than what we today believe coming from uh, the scenarios that remain plausible with the amount of fossil fuels that we can access. If I uh, develop a little bit, I do believe that the higher end of the bracket regarding scenarios, which is emissions uh, growing and growing during the 21st century is plausible because my belief is that uh, we will experience some kind of slow collapse before the end of the century preventing the economy from growing, and so preventing emissions from growing. So the, the scenario, which is a healthy, in quote, uh, economy, and healthier and healthier, in quote, uh, economy, becoming bigger and bigger until, the, until 2100, and powered by fossil fuels, is something that I don't believe possible. I don't deem it, it is physically possible. Yep. Uh, what is possible is that we get uh, a, a, a peak fossil uh, some, some, sometime around 2050, 2060 or, or so. But that would, that would be enough to trigger a three degrees plus scenario. And where I wanted and what I want to elaborate is that the consequences of a three degrees plus scenario might be much, much more ample than what we believe today. Yep. Because there are plenty of, of, of processes uh, with threshold effects in the world. Uh, and basically, we discover them when it's too late. Uh, I'll, I will give a couple of examples. Ten years ago, I had never heard of the possible collapse of the Western Antarctic ice sheet, which is today considered possible, uh, starting from 1.5 degrees uh, of, of global warming. Ten years ago, I had not heard of the possible complete melting of, green, of the Greenland ice sheet in a couple of centuries, of course, but uh, which is something which is today considered possible, not certain, but possible. Uh, Ten years ago, I had not heard of the possibility of the whole Amazon forest turning into a dry forest or even a savanna, uh, which is something which is today considered possible. Etc. Etc. So uh, basically, and I remember that uh, 20 years ago, I did uh, some kind of TV show in France, and uh, we elaborated a false uh, meteo for uh, weather forecast uh, for 2090, and the temperature uh, that we mentioned was 40 degrees Celsius, <laughs> which is something that we get today each summer in France. So uh, basically, uh, my belief is that we should not be reassured uh, yeah. by that. The higher end of the, of, the, of the warming is not possible, but the higher end of the consequences that we get for a given warming today will, will, will be overcome. And the reason why is that the models that go from a global temperature increase to the consequences in a given sector being uh, the possible dismantling of an ice cap or uh, the evolution of yields uh, regarding maize or rice are models that are built with the past variability and they do not embed the possible future variability. And some recent research has been published in Nature saying that if we increased a lot the, the, the variability in the future of, of climate parameters, 
we get damage which is much much higher but if we do not do that i totally agree with you uh yeah we don't have enough to meet the high threshold but we have plenty to have a disaster uh in the climate so um i have so many questions for you uh let me just keep firing because you are are giving succinct and very articulate answers not in your native language by the way so thank you for that <laughs> So a main news story in France, uh, kind of ongoing has been protests and unrest over the raising of the retirement age and the threshold for pension fund access. Do you think that this connects back to energy scarcity? And do you think we'll have more of this type of response or do the French just have a certain proclivity for civil unrest? Uh, well, we have the two, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we, we like to complain, uh, which is, it's a, it's a national sport here uh, to complain uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, we today have retirement thanks to abundant energy i mean two centuries ago there was no retirement uh, actually it's not true uh, ret retirement was invented by colbert four centuries ago and he did that for uh, the royal navy and at the time there were twenty thousand sailors and, re and you could get retirement uh, when you turn 60. And believe me, uh, in 1600 something, uh, turning 60, which means surviving scorbut and adverse fire, <laughs> was, I mean, he didn't make a major risk with the budget, uh, our friend Colbert. Right. Uh, but, thanks to, but thanks to energy, now we have so much production given by machines that we can feed and, 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 and provide clothes and housing and, and cars and everything to people that work, in quotes, which is giving orders to machines today, working, and people that do not work, but some of them physically do exactly the same thing. You see, for example, today I'm supposed to work. I'm a consultant. I'm sitting behind an office and I work. What is working for me? Talking to you. Is that work? It is not work. I mean, <laughs> if I, if, if, if in a couple of hours, I will talk to somebody else doing exactly the same thing, sitting on a chair, will not, will not be through a computer, and it will not be work, it will be later. I mean, what is the difference in physical terms? No difference. So what we call work today for plenty of people is something that a middle-aged peasant would have called leisure, sitting on a chair mm. and talking, or sitting on a mm. chair and uh, typing on, 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 the, on, the, on the keypad of a, on the typepad, sorry, of, of a computer. Well, okay, big deal. This is not work. Uh, so retirement uh, is actually a gift of abundant energy. You have no retirement in countries that are very sober regarding their energy consumption. And so, of course, unfortunately, I have to say, uh, the, the long-term trend is that in the future, it will be harder and harder to retire. So building on that, let me ask you a, a, a difficult question. I frequently cite that a barrel of oil is worth around five years of, of human labor. You've made similar statements, um, including that we've essentially replaced sa slave labor with, with fossil fuels. So if energy supply is yeah, going to contract, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my order of magnitude. I've got exactly the same order of magnitude. Yes. Well, it's five it, years of work, of yeah. human work, of hard, of very hard work. Yeah, very hard work. Yes. Well, it's the, the actual math is around 12 years, but humans are more efficient with directing muscle labor to actual work. So you have to handicap it, but it's around four and a half, five years. So, so you just suggested that of the 16 uh, exporting countries that Europe imports oil from, they'll be cut in half their production by 2050, uh, plus or minus. So if we contract energy supply, we are con we're also GDP and jobs are also going to shrink. So do you think it's likely or possible that we see a resurgence in things like slavery as fossil energy availability declines? And, and do you have hopes that we can avoid such a scenario? Uh, it's my fear. Uh, my fear is that relationships between humans uh, will become, uh, I would say, uh, harder than they were, uh, that we will have more, uh, uh, I don't know how the, the expression in English, uh, rapport de force. Uh, we'll have tensions 
be between humans and, and, and brutal force uh, will be more important than than, than it was. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not sure that we'll have less less work. We might have less jobs or less revenues. Uh, mm -hmm. But but when we had no machines, uh, we worked harder. So uh, I do not know exactly how it's going to recompose. I mean, but the, the, the main ideas are uh, we'll work, it, we'll have more hard work uh, and we'll earn less, basically. Uh, because what energy did is uh, triggering the exact opposite, working less uh, and, and, and earning more. That's what I refer to as the great simplification, uh, the name of this podcast based on Tainter's premise of complexification if required energy. If, if it's possible, because you see, two centuries ago, the world economy relied on only nine metals. It relied on iron, copper, zinc, tin, uh, lead, and, and, and a couple of the more. Today, you do not have a single element of the table of Mendeleev that doesn't have an industrial application, not one. And you and I, we depend on all these 92 elements uh, because, for example, uh, you depend, as I depend, on uh, on the digital system, which by itself requires 60 to 70 different elements. Today, there is no single company that can operate within, within a, an information system. No one. I mean, if you go back to uh, paper sheets <laughs> and pencils, you cannot operate any company today. Uh, we So basically, in simplifi simplifying the present world, is going to be extremely hard, extremely yeah. hard. So you're getting at complexity, which I refer to as one of the big four risks that we face. Oh, I, I consider them to be the financial system, geopolitics, complexity, and the social contract. Not energy per se, but it's the it's the change from abundant energy to flat or declining that will trigger those other those other things. Um, so you've got uh, in Europe a real time uh, trial of this of sorts going on right now because of the Russian uh, situation in Ukraine. In in your experience in France, what have people's responses been, uh, especially last winter, to increasing prices in Europe? Um, has it created stronger community cohesion and and a return to relying on social capital or has it caused more division over scarcity or what's been your your kind of uh uh trial run basically in france it has triggered very high prices of natural gas and energy i uh, know electricity sorry and it has triggered sa significant savings uh by people so they heated less uh, they use less electricity. A number of, of, of companies and, and mostly energy intensive industries produce less. Uh, that's basically what happened. I have not felt a major change uh, in social structures or the way people behave. Uh, actually, it has nothing to do with what happened during the COVID, for example. Uh, last year, nothing much happened to what what the the political response uh, has been significant, uh, and now the word sobriety is everywhere uh, in in political speeches. Uh, that is something significant. What does the word sobriety mean? It means uh, actually, I, I my own classification of energy savings uh, includes three well counts three terms. The first one is efficiency. Efficiency is getting the same service while using less energy, either to manufacture an object or to use it. The second uh, term that I use is sobriety, which is deliberately waiving a service or a good in order to save resources or energy. For example, I was using a car, I use a bike, or I commute by train. Uh, this is sobriety. And poverty is exactly the same physical item than sobriety, only you didn't ask for it. 
uh, so sobriety is having no longer the economic means to own a car or to use it. Uh, and so you have to, to, to use a, a bike or to go by train, but you didn't want it. Okay. Uh, my belief is that today what happens in France is actually poverty. People didn't ask for it and they have to uh, mm. organize themselves differently. But the government, is ca no government can use the word poverty. <laughs> so they use the word sobri sobriety, which is giving the impression that we do it in an organized and uh, deliberate way. It, it gives people agency to uh, have sobriety instead of poverty. Um, so is it, I, I think the distinction between those two is really important and clever. Do you think that individuals listening to this program or cultures, nations, can choose sobriety before it is forced upon us as poverty? Uh, I believe no. Uh, one of my friends that uh, with whom I, 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 uh, I work in France says, you have the strategy of your sets. <laughs> uh, so it basically goes the other way around. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, my, my belief is that the, the best that you can hope is that the day you have a shock or a crash, then you can pull out of the drawer a sobriety plan that was framed or conceived before you had the shock or the crash. But I don't believe that you will, that, that, that democracies will spontaneously implement a decrease of their production uh, and their consumption. But I do believe that they, that they can decide to go that direction the day they realize that anyway, they do not have the choice. Uh, again, because that's, that's the strategy of your set. And if I can be a little bit rude, because <laughs> I understand that I'm talking mostly to US auditors, uh, I believe that it's going to be even more complicated in the US, which is the land of plenty, uh, which was built on uh, tremendous resources, uh, tremendous land, uh, and basically through getting rid of all the, the, the previous uh, inhabitants and, and, and <laughs> animals that were there. Uh, it's going to, so it's the world with no, I mean, the, the, the country with no limits by excellence is the US. Uh, and so it's going to be even harder in the US than it is in Europe. Well, let me, let me ask you about that because because Europe will arguably have to face sobriety and poverty before the U.S. does, because we still produce ninety some percent of our own energy. Yes. Will that be a blessing yes. or a curse? Will Europe uh, have to suffer the pain first, but they will reorganize in different ways that will ultimately be more helpful? What do you think? Uh, I think it can be both, uh, and history will tell. Uh, I, I I don't know. I mean. It's, it's a blessing uh, in the way that, uh, what I hope, is that we use the residual fossil fuels that we have at hand to build a world that can operate the best it can without fossil fuels. Uh, it is not something that people understand clearly today. It, it, it is an idea which is making its way, but slowly. Uh, and, uh, of course, I believe that in the U.S. you are farther from that from that idea, because you still have plenty of resources. Mm. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I won't, I won't, <laughs> uh, you, you will not learn with me that actually your country is two countries. Uh, you have the US of the coast and the US of the middle. Uh, yeah. And actually, it's two different countries. Uh, and the reaction to what I'm, I'm explaining right now. Is, is totally different uh, whether you are talking to uh, Massachusetts or California uh, or Wisconsin uh, or, 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 or Ohio. So, so I'm actually, again, totally aligned with you on this. I don't think we're going to change until we're forced to. So the best thing that people listening to this and you and I are working on is building those plans for when that moment comes. So you, uh, among other uh, projects, um, you run the SHIFT project, which has plans for transforming the French economy. Can you give a brief overview of, of what you're doing and what your hopes are there? Yes. Uh, 
that 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 work uh, started uh, during the COVID. Actually, when the, when the COVID uh, stroke, uh, it was clear for me that a number of companies would ask for help. Uh, they would say, okay, we cannot operate that anymore. Uh, give us some money or we'll have to fire. We we'll go bankrupt and we fire everyone, which in France is much more drama than in the US. Uh, and so I thought at the time, uh, one of the things that we should try to design is the counterparts that the state should ask to these companies before lending them a helping hand. So, uh, okay, we are going to sign a check, but we ask to you, we ask you, sorry, to uh, do th this and that regarding being able to operate in a world with less fossil fuels. And uh, then we realized pretty quickly that our work would never be ready uh, before uh, the first checks would be signed. And so we said, okay, we are going to do something slightly different. We are going to design a plan, which is how we should reorganize the economy if we want to, uh, if we want to al align ourselves with a decrease of, uh, the, the, of 5% per year of the greenhouse gases emissions in the world. And uh, this is called the Plan de Transformation de l'Economie Française, Plan to Transform the French Economy. And actually, it's an attempt to do economy without talking euros or dollars at first, but we talk physical flows. So basically what we do is that we look at the physical flows that frame the economy, the construction sector, the, 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 the automotive industry, uh, the way we grow and uh, grow food and transform it, etc. And we say, if we want to decrease that by 5%, if we, sorry, if we want to decrease the greenhouse gases emissions by 5% per year, what does it mean regarding the number of cars that we manufacture, given the energy efficiency of manufacturing one car, the number of houses that we build, uh, the number of people that can move around uh, in cars, in trucks, etc., and the number of people that are employed in the different sectors. So it's, it's a plan to transform the system without saying we should invest money here, finance uh, such a sector with uh, so many billion dollars here, etc. We do not talk money at all. Mm. And it's a method, in a way, uh, to address the economy as a physical system. And it, 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 we, it, we had a huge success in France uh, because we published a book uh, which was called the Plan de Transformation de l'Economie Française. And we sold over 100,000 copies, which in France is a huge success uh, for a book, for an essay. Uh, in order to give you a, a comparison, it happens that a graphic novel uh, that I wrote uh, with Christophe Blanc, uh, which is called The World Without End, The Monde mm -hmm. Sans Fin in French, was in 2022 uh, the number one book in France, the most sold book in France, and we sold a little bit over 500,000 copies. So 100,000 copies for an essay on decarbonizing the French economy, it, it's, it's a huge success. I mean, we, 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 in, 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 our, yeah. in our wildest dreams, uh, we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't have come up with such a figure. And plenty of top executives have read it. Uh, plenty of politicians have read it. Uh, and I, I, I believe that we have oriented a little uh, the debate in France uh, on the way to uh, decarbonize the economy with this work and with this book. So it's a method again, uh, and we could apply it to the US uh, exactly the same. I mean, exactly the same method. It's how do we orient the physical flows of economy? Uh, if we want to decrease the greenhouse gases emissions by X percent per year. So in, in the global north, uh, I suspect that fr the country that you live in, France, may be closer as a culture to understanding climate energy constraints, partially due to your book. You said 500,000 copies. Partially there's this collapsology, uh, uh, you know, subculture their uh, French president Macron periodically voices comments that the best times are behind us economically. You know, are these books and discussions allowing France to be ahead of the curve, discussing limits to growth, sobriety, uh, and is, is that good or bad? What is your thought? 
again, we have the strategy of our sets. <laughs> uh, what is our sets? It's our history. We're an old country. Uh, we have experienced uh, hunger, wars, physical limits of all kinds. Uh, and so just as Great Britain, uh, just as uh, Scandinavian countries, just as Switzerland. So the only countries that had an easy life uh, in the ancient world were Italy and Spain, uh, which are countries today that are, I would say not, they are not as comfortable as countries that are farther up north uh, with large scale organizations designed to face a constraint. Uh, and uh, so it's only the result of our history. Uh, when you look at other countries in the world that resemble us, you have Japan, a uh, country with no resources, uh, very strong technical culture, uh, and which is also very conscious of the limits, of the physical limits today. And you have, in a way, China, uh, same thing. I mean, China is an old country that has experienced also hunger, uh, wars, uh, physical limits, uh, and which is also a country of engineers, historically. Uh, in, in ancient China, uh, the top class people were the engineers able to operate all the hydraulic system uh, feeding the rice paddies, uh, well, uh, or, or supplying the rice paddies. So uh, all these countries have things in common, which countries that have been recently occupied and which are very, I would say, uh, very big, uh, vast countries with plenty of resources uh, are not like the US, uh, like Brazil, like Canada, in a way like Russia, what we could call anti-countries. Well, these countries are not so comfortable with uh, global physical limits. So um, in preparing for this interview, Jean-Marc, I was reading about you yesterday um, and you are increasingly being called a guru and a most influential public <laughs> intellectual in French media. How, how, I'm just curious, how are you navigating, describing our extremely challenging biophysical reality in a political system that in France and globally rewards simplicity and feel-good messaging where your message is, is kind of counter to that. How, how are you finding that? What has changed the relationship between an individual and the population today is social networks. Uh, my fate would probably have been very different in a world with only media uh, mm. because I would have, in that world, without pleasing the journalist, uh, nobody would have heard of me. Uh, in the modern world, with the social media, you can put online videos, you can put online long videos of conferences, you can put online explanations. Uh, I used to maintain, now it's a, it's a bit old-fashioned, uh, a website uh, to vulgarize energy and climate change uh, issues. And uh, the reason why uh, the, the graphic novel that I mentioned before was a success is that before that, the online videos of the course that I teach at Min Paris was already a success. And the reason why is that, well, success by French figures. <laughs> uh, I think I, 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 I went up to 1 million views or something like that. Uh, and it's, it was a success because people appreciate consistency. Uh, actually, I believe that the reason why uh, I have had a uh, small success is that I offered to a number of people that were vaguely conscious of something but couldn't put a name on it, uh, all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle uh, that they can assemble and get a clear picture of. Uh, that's that's what I, I, I provide. So I provide them with some kind of comfort of not being so stupid because they felt mm. that something was not corresponding to the, the explanations they got elsewhere basically. And uh, the fact that I have a base in a way that I can address directly through social media, uh, like for example, today I, I, I write a daily post on LinkedIn. Mm. Uh, I publish videos online once in a while, etc. Makes it so that uh, 
my reputation cannot be made only by the media. Whereas in the past, you were fully dependent on what uh, the, the media said of you uh, for your reputation. Now it's a little bit different. Hmm. So there, there is the, 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 the relationship that I have with the press uh, is, uh, I would say, in between a distant relationship. I, 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 whenever I get an invitation, I don't say yes all the time. Actually, I say yes one time out of 10, maybe. Uh, and uh, I don't feel like I, I desperately need them. And actually, my day-to-day -day job doesn't involve them. I mean, my day-to-day -day job is to run a company and to chair an NGO. I mean, it does, has nothing to do with the media. And uh, so when, when I'm labeled a guru of whatever, whatever uh, the best thing that I, that I can do is not respond. <laughs> it's not <laughs> responding. Uh, and if, if, if some people uh, mention it to me, then I answer saying what I think of it. I mean, uh, well, I, I think people, um, not only value consistency, but they value truth and authenticity. And I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect as events get, um, closer, as we have more expensive and less available energy, that the conventional media will not be able to tell the full biophysical truth that you and I are telling, uh, it's just too, too threatening to the general public. So the role that you and others are playing is very interesting, uh, in informing and hopefully inspiring society towards change. Uh, do you agree? Partially only because I think that, uh, what the press can do is uh, describe simultaneously a problem and the way to react to the problem. Hmm. Just saying over and over and over that there is a problem is yeah. something indeed that they don't appreciate much. Right. And actually, when you look at the way they've authorized climate change, they have selected information which is distant in space and in time. Basically, the, the, the information that they like the most is what will happen in 2100 and the global temperature increase. So right. this is distant in time, 2100, and it is distant in space because it's a global temperature and you don't feel a global temperature and I don't mm. feel a global temperature. I mean, I feel the temperature which is right now in the room where I am and you feel the temperature which is right now in the room where you are. And we neither of us feels the average temperature. It doesn't exist for our senses. Mm. And, but uh, what the media uh, don't uh, speak of much, and uh, there was a, an article published also in the scientific literature pointing that uh, a couple of months ago, that they, they, they very much relay uh, information that pertains to things that are not so distant in the future and pretty local. Like, for example, what will be the flow of the Colorado River in 10 years and the consequences that it can have on crops? That that is something that they do not that they do not give much audience to to this kind of scientific work. Even though you have plenty of scientific publications uh, that 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 uh, uh, pertain to this kind of of, of issue. Uh, so what they like again, uh, the media is uh, talking of an issue when you have the beginning of a solution or the beginning of a way to react uh, or to act facing the issue. And this is why I've, I've, I've set up the SHIP project. The SHIP project is actually fully devoted to uh, proposing ways uh, to confront the issue and, and to react to the issue and to organize ourselves with the issue. Uh, that's, so it also tries to provide hope in a way. And then you can get more audience on both the issue and the way to react to the issue. The, major, the, the, the leading economic paper in France, which is called Les Echo, gives much more audience to environmental issues now than it did just two years ago. Mm -hmm. But the reason why is that they right now also have many stories to tell regarding companies or action 
which is being taken to face the issue. So that, that, that's the reason why. And do I believe that France is at the forefront? Uh, mm. I would say in, in a bunch which is globally very late, the answer is yes. <laughs> so what I believe is that uh, in, a, in a collection of countries that are globally extremely late, France is a little bit less late than the others. We, right. we, are, uh, we, have done, we have done a number of things that were done for the first time. <laughs> Well, I mean, you and I have been telling variations of this story publicly for 20 years, and I feel that the, the world events have caught up to the story <clears throat> that we're telling. What, what's your experience? Uh, are people, obviously, because of your popularity, people are now more receptive to this? I believe it goes the other way around. I believe I am popular because people realized. <laughs> I will put uh... it the other way around. Uh, people realize surfing it. on the wave. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because we have heat waves, uh, because we have uh, prices of gasoline going up yeah. and down and uh, up very often, uh, because we have. Uh, I mean, yes. Uh, yeah. Because people realize. Uh, so, and, and for example, let me take another example, which is the opinion that French have on nuclear energy. Hmm. It gained recently 20 percentage points uh in support so about 50 percent of the french population supported nuclear energy two years ago uh one third were against and 15 percent said they had no opinion it went it jumped from from 50 to 70 percent in two mm. years so you could say okay that's Jean-Claude's fault uh yeah but actually it evolved exactly the same way in all other european countries well, that could be because exactly of Russia and Ukraine. Even in yes. Germany, yeah, whatever. Even in yeah. Germany, it gained 50, 15 percentage points of support. And I am sure of one thing, that in Germany, people have never heard of me. Uh, and in Finland, people have never heard of me. And uh, in Spain, mm -hmm. people have never heard of me. So it. So I, 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 I think we should put it the other way around. First, mm -hmm. people realize, and then they well, the, 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 the people that say, I can explain you why, become popular. So um, I have some closing questions that I ask all my guests. I have so much more I want to talk to you about. But before I get to those questions, uh, let me just ask you uh, one, one final content question. What the hell are we going to do? <laughs> what should we do uh, <laughs> facing this as, as nations? You're on the spot, Jean-Marc. Go for it. Uh, as nations, we will do what our populations ask for, uh, as long as we are democracies, which is why at the SHIP project, we never considered that we should address first and foremost uh, politicians, but we believe that we should address first and foremost the civil society. So the people that we're interested to deal with are people who are deciding in the economic sector, are deciding as civil servants, uh, are deciding as academics, uh, so people that frame our collective knowledge, uh, and people that uh, are deciding in the NGO sector. So this is our primary audience. Uh, the people that we want to talk to is the civil society. And we believe that the day we are able to convince a sufficient fraction of that civil society, then it goes up because democracies are systems that go up uh, and the elected people have to take that into account in a way or another. Uh, and I never believe that we should talk to politicians first. Uh, and actually, I, I'm not specially eager to talk to them. I mean, once in a while, I've got an invitation from a minister or whatever. So I'm polite. I go to it, but uh, I don't hope much for it. And what I, what, what my, my real the, the audience that I'm really interested in is the civil society. So we need to so shift society to before, before the politicians. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you, 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 you have a president elected because you have people voting for him, basically. I mean, <laughs> yes. uh, and, uh, and a, a significant fraction of the civil society in France still 
I don't know if the word is appropriate, but escapes uh, our influence. Uh, all the people that vote for the populist parties, uh, basically, we, we are not able to talk to them today, uh, which is an issue, uh, which is a big issue. I mean, we have to talk to these people, and I still haven't found a way to do so. Mm. Uh, because these people actually are the first losers uh, of the energy contraction. They don't realize it, but they are the first. Mm. Uh, so we, we, we have to talk to them and we have to embark them uh, on, on, the, on, on the plan that we believe is, uh, is, 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 is uh, I would say, responds correctly to the situation. Uh, and I don't see that uh, at my age there is much more that I can do than, than going on uh, doing what I've already done, uh, which is working with companies at Carbon4, uh, working with the civil society and the SHIP project, and writing books. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which, uh, and as you may know, uh, the, the Le Monde Sans Fin is going to be released in the US. We are oh. currently working uh, right now with my co-author on the US version because we have to move from meters to feet, uh, <laughs> square meters to <laughs> oh square feet. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and we have no, and we have to change all the examples uh, that pertain to France into examples uh. that pertain to the US. And uh, when will so when will that be out? In the, in, it should be released at the end of the year, uh, okay. if we're lucky. Uh, so end of the year or beginning of next year, if we take too long in in, uh, in finishing the adaptation. So so the the ultimate plan then is to combine uh, efficiency and sobriety at multiple scales in society to. Uh, avert collapse and avert just abject poverty, some combination at institutional government and individual levels. Yes? Yes, basically you've summarized it correctly. Yeah. Uh, excellent. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting your book. Uh, let me ask you a few closing questions, Jean-Marc, that I ask all my guests. Uh, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, nations, et cetera. What, personal advice do you have to people uh, watching this video, listening to this show at this time of global meta crisis? Uh, I would say I have two. The first one is devote time to understand what's going on. Uh, because basically, uh, the solid conclusions that you get to is always the conclusions that you have come to by yourself. Uh, mm. we, we are we are I mean, human nature is such that we don't like that much conclusions that we're framed by others. We like our own. Mm. So uh, take time, uh, dig into the issue, uh, read, listen to people, uh, watch conferences, whatever. Read scientific literature if you if you can do it. Or otherwise, watch videos of people that are good at burglarizing uh, the, the the issue. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, do not stay alone, uh, because it's an issue which is, uh, it's easy to become anxious uh, when, when you realize the magnitude of the issue. And uh, we don't like, one of the things that we don't like is to uh, pull ourselves out of a group because we yeah. have understood something that the rest of the group hasn't understood. Uh, and so we will never do that. Uh, <laughs> to take action. So the only action that we're able to take, at least in Europe, maybe in the US it's a little bit different, but uh, is collective action, which is why it's easier to do something in the, in, in, in the frame of a job, uh, in, in, in the professional world, it's easier to do something because it can be collective action. And we need to still have social relationships. We still need to have a couple, friends, kids, relatives, whatever. Uh, and so uh, moving forward is something which is much easier to do when you belong to a group. Is there a way that the 500,000 people that bought your book or the 100,000 people that bought your uh, transformation uh, uh, essay or that follow your LinkedIn can connect and actually meet and talk to each other in France, uh, like Discord or? There is a sister uh, association of the SHIP project, 
which is called the Shifters, which is uh, the, the association of all the people that want to give a helping hand to uh, the, the work of the SHIFT project. Uh, and actually, this association great. today has around 20, has around 20,000 members, uh, a small number of them being uh, in foreign countries. Uh, of course, but by and large, the, 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 the two first foreign countries are Belgium and Switzerland, because it's French-speaking mm -hmm. countries. Uh, but we have a we have a group in the in the, in the UK and we probably have a small group in the US small group though uh, and so it's a uh, and and this association is a uh, very well structured I mean it's structured as a company uh, because most people that uh, belong to that association come from the professional from from the professional world and so they have organized the association as basically as a company uh, so it's very well structured and. Uh, and so, yes, we have that. How would you change your answer about those two bits of advice uh, if you were talking to young humans uh, in France or in the United States or anywhere in the world, 16, 18, 20 years old, who are learning about climate change and that energy availability might be uh, in oil half of what it is uh, 30 years from now? What, what sort of recommendations would you give to young people? Uh, actually, the youngest people that I often talk to are students. Uh, mm -hmm. So I do not talk to people. I do not very often talk to people that are still in high school or uh, primary school. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but I would say that probably that my first advice is to be reasonably good uh, in science which is the way to connect to the physical world and the way to understand how things work, uh, how the world works, uh, where to listen at, at, at weak signals, uh, to, to look at weak signals before uh, they become of first magnitude. So probably that the best uh, advice that I would give to, the, to, 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 I would say, young people uh, would be to... Uh, Try, try to be good uh, in science at large, which is, again, uh, connecting with the physical world. If you could wave a magic wand and there was no personal recourse to your decision, what is one thing you would do to improve human and planetary futures? Suppress greed. That that would require a magic wand, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, including for me, including for you, including for everyone. I mean, it's it's a, one of the things that kills us. Is that is that desire to have uh, always more? Well, um, energy surplus has certainly turbocharged that in humans. I think without as much energy surplus, we, there was no possibility of having more all the time. So that, that is one of the things that scares me the most is the concept of loss aversion, because we are the richest generation ever to live, uh, of humans on this planet. And we would be happy, uh, with half what we have, but getting from here to there is, is going to be a doozy um, because of our psychological expectations are not that as a culture. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. So um, this has been a great first uh, overview of your work. I know you are uh, a nuclear, uh, a world expert on nuclear energy, and we didn't really have time to, to dive into that. If you were to come back on the program uh, six months from now, what is one particular issue that you are passionate about that's relevant to our future that we could take a deep dive on? Do you have any speculation? I don't think that all the tele technological debates, uh, be it on nuclear energy or, 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 or wind energy or hydrogen or etc., is a fundamental debate. Uh, basically, the fundamental debate is on, is on cultural issues, uh, just, just the one that we've stated. Uh, will will we succeed one day 
uh, in putting uh, ethics above agree, for example, we will succeed. Uh, and it, it seems to me that this debate is much more fundamental, even though I've been trained as an engineer, and for a very, very long time, I was convinced uh, that the future was in technical fixes. Uh, well, now I believe that actually uh, it's in uh, the way we, we, we accept uh, to, 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 to change uh, our, our, our cultural references, which is much harder, actually. Uh, uh, it's much easier to build a nuclear reactor than changing the, the, our minds. The, yeah, the next tech is maybe uh, inner tech, the tech in our, in our minds on how we experience the world and how we can get most of the things we really want without lead, uh, using a lot of energy and, and materials. At least that's my hope. Uh, this has been great. It was so nice well, to meet you. And like I said, uh, it feels like we're on parallel paths in different parts of the world. And if I can help you in your work, uh, uh, let me know. And I will definitely um, get your book when it comes to the United States. And we'll put all the show notes uh, on this episode of your references and such. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases.